On behalf of uh, Global CIO Forum, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the 2021 edition of the World CIO 200. As you all know, established in uh, 2017, the World CIO 200 Roadshow is a multi-country CIO award ceremony that uh, recognizes the ach achievement of the transformation leaders of today. The CIO Awards is not only a competition, as we say, but it is a celebration of uh, the amazing life of the CIOs and their career span. After touring 26 countries in 2020, uh, this year, the 2021 Roadshow is touring 36 countries. So this year, we would be following the theme of hashtag the change. So what is this change all about? At uh, the World CIO 200 Roadshow, CIOs from 36 plus countries, uh, they will be challenging the legacies that were overthrown uh, through the pandemic, uh, charter policies for a new digital ecosystem, and change the policies and governance being the catalyst of their organizations. Transformation through change, that is the overriding uh, theme of the roadshow this year. And uh, we would be gathering global IT leaders and CIOs. Uh, the 36th country roadshow will be culminating in a grand finale that will be held face to face in the UAE in the month of November. Uh, top selected CIOs from these 36 countries would be flying down to the UAE for two days of absolute um, knowledge sharing and global best practices. Uh, the two days, uh, CIOs will have a unique op opportunity to fast track their growth and solution uh, providers and partners who would be joining us for the two days, uh, they would have an ideal opportunity to build their brand, uh, present their solutions, and meet and greet with 300 plus uh, CIOs who are flying in from across the world. So on that uh, note, and to officially inaugurate the event, um, I would like to uh, call upon the CEO of uh, GEC Media Group, Mr. Ronak Samantrai, uh, to please come on the stage and officially welcome uh, you for the 2021 of CIO 200. Welcome, Ronak. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who has uh, joined in for the CIO 200 Roadshow. And uh, today, the stop is at Bahrain, and we are hosting our the first leg of the CIO 200 Roadshow, which will be taking place in 36 plus countries this year. We are really, really excited to, to make it as more interactive we can. There's a lot of, uh, lot of new things uh, which has been added this year. And uh, again, uh, before I move forward, uh, uh, definitely the first, uh, first leg would be the virtual and then we will have the grand finale which will be a hybrid event and as we all know because of the pandemic since last two years we all have shifted to digital so this time we will be bringing in a very fresh new very interactive platform and it is one of its kind I can bet you on that because uh, the amount of effort the team has put in it is looking really amazing and this is all for you guys and for everyone who will be joining us across the globe to give them a digitally best platform and uh, and of course so once the roadshow is done we will be having the grand finale and as the situation of pandemic is getting better so we will be doing it as a hybrid event and we are all excited for that, and uh, which will be happening in Dubai, like in UAE, and uh, which will be taking place in November, December. And uh, again, without a doubt, this is only possible for all our major sponsors who've been a very, very supportive in our uh, sponsorships. And uh, they have been a very, very crucial part of us and I really thank each and every single sponsor for, 
from my side and from GEC Media Group. And oh, without uh, late, we, we should start the CIO Roadshow Bahrain 2021. Thank you and have a great day today. Thank you so much, Ronak, for uh, presenting the welcome note. And uh, yes, um, as you said, this journey would not have been possible without the support of our partners and sponsors. A big uh, shout out uh, to our partners who are making this journey more interesting. Infoblox, BMB, Laserfish, Veritas, F5 Exclusive Networks, Arkin, and Finis. Th thank you so much for your support as always. And uh, with that, uh, we move on to the CIO 200 Bahrain uh, round today. And to present our opening keynote, I would like to call upon Dr. Jasim Haji, the president of IGOAI and our advisory for CIO 200 Bahrain chapter, a very influential person in Bahrain, a very well-known person in this part of the world. Dr. Haji has a uh, management and executive experience in aviation, hospitality, technology, telecommunications for over 30 years. He is also an international expert strategist in AI and transformation, apart from being the president of the Artificial Intelligence uh, Group. He got his doctorate in business administration in 2010. Uh, and apart from all the various publications and uh, four books that he has uh, worked on, he has also been instrumental in implementing several projects based on AI, ma machine learning, and chatbots. Dr. Haji, as always, it's a pleasure to have you. The stage is all yours now. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the edition of Bahrain Awards for the Distinguished Technology Leaders. This is, have been happening in Bahrain for over seven years. Thanks to GEC, we've been committed to prosper Bahrain's technology and bring it to the roadmap of the Middle East and the global level. We have witnessed many CIOs, technology leaders, entrepreneurs who have been uh, winners of the award in the past. Today we are seeing a new set of winners. Those who have been reviewed thoroughly, and I assure you, deservedly, Lingi win these awards. Uh, we are proud of these uh, Bahraini young men and women that are part of the international group of artificial intelligence community or those who are leading the technology in the island. Now, why is it important to recognize the leaders, to recognize the technology gurus, those who contribute to the growth of artificial intelligence? International group of artificial intelligence, which covers over 23 countries around the globe and is growing and it has more than 200 members and is growing, the fastest growing community of artificial intelligence in the whole globe. We are recognizing men and women in the GCC, in the Middle East, in Asia, and around the world. And thanks to GCC media who have been supporters of this. Now today we are gathered in Bahrain to see these leaders who have been working behind the scenes are recognized and even as a token of thanks provided with the virtual uh, recognition. But it is more than that. We are trying to grow these communities. Within the artificial group of artificial intelligence, this is going to be the aim through the multiple conferences, through the recognitions, through the white papers, through the discussions around the world to exchange ideas, to exchange technologies, and not only as a knowledge, but as a practice to implement them in new workplaces. Now, again, uh, there are more important people who will make speech and it's time for them today to shine. I just wanted to share with you a few minutes and recognize 
those who have been participating in this forum and those who have been winning it and send a clear message to the leaders of the AI in, in this part of the world and the technology to say the future is yours and your work has been recognized by us and I'm sure by others. You have a pleasant day and we'll see you soon again. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Haji, for that welcome note. As always, it's wonderful to have you. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your valuable uh, time with us. Um, on that note, I would like to call upon our first speaker from uh, Bahrain, Mr. Ahmed Mohammed Buhaza. He's the Vice President of Bahrain ICT Society for the next session. Uh, Mr. Bohaza would be talking about Bahrain's overall IT transformation outlook and the future of technology and how Bahrain is preparing for the same. Uh, Mr. Bohaza, welcome. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, the stage is all yours. Welcome, everybody. I'm very happy to be with you in this event, the CIO 200 Pro Show. I would like to thank GEC Media Group for these uh, valuable events and conferences that they are always organizing. Uh, in this uh, speech, I will not talk about digital transformation, which we all know. I'll be talking about digital acceleration and the impact of pandemic and what opportunities are rising in front of us. Uh, this world have gone through many uh, iteration, uh, iteration and changes. Uh, if we go back on the 17th century, when they discovered the water power, there was a, a change. And whenever they in, uh, find a new source of power or they uh, develop the uh, trans transportation or communication, there is a major change. So it have taken the way first wave 60 years to this, for this change to be, uh, let's say, spreading and to be adapted. Uh, maybe much shorter uh, in, uh, with the, when they discovered the steam power and shorter when they discovered the electricity. Uh, and you can see from the uh, picture in front of you, every time they discover a new source of power or new source or way of communication, the wave reduces in terms of duration and increase in terms of impact. And you can see this more when they discovered or introduced the internet. And more they were expecting when, with AI, IoT, robots, robotics. But what happened in, uh, recently when COVID-19 came, now this has became much, much shorter. And the impact is very high and very deep. And this is clear, يعني, we, any restaurant, they don't serve uh, delivery, they are not uh, in business. Uh, education became online. People, they were working from, uh, from, off, from home, not from office, distance working. So all these change, nobody can imagine that will happen. And these waves are reducing in terms of size, increasing in terms of depth, and I promise you that you will not rest. Digital transformation is very important and uh, well understood in our region. And you can see Bahrain as the number three in terms of uh, adapting to a number of uh, variables in the transport tra transformation index. We all know that digital transformation is not business enabler. It is business a driver. And that's why all these countries, including Bahrain, they, they were uh, very keen. So you find there is a strategy for the digital transformation. There is a number of initiatives and there is drivers like in Bahrain, there is IGA or e-government authority. And uh, it, is, it is not an easy task. It is not a website that you will put the content on it. It is not on, also only processes or interconnected processes. It is a change, and change does not involve technological uh, challenge. It does not involve um, uh, uh, understanding the current needs 
only. It involves people acceptance, awareness, adoption. This is the challenge. So there is bright, brilliant, excellent systems. They fail because of this. But when COVID-19 came, everything has changed. We never been uh, we never imagined that we will be able to work from home. We never uh, uh, accepted the idea that people could learn from online. I posted this uh, image which you see now in uh, LinkedIn. Actually, I, yeah, I, although I have a large number of uh, audience, but I'm not always having a lot of images interact with a lot of interactions. In two weeks, this picture have uh, got 20,000 views and more than 300 likes. The question was, who led the digital transformation of your company? Normally it is the leader, the CEO, or the CTO, because he knows the business. But we never thought that COVID-19 will make it. Made the people accepting the law working from home, uh, business as well, people understanding and accepting learning, they don't want to stop learning. So everything being accepted because of COVID-19, because of the emergency, because of the need. And actually that's why uh, Satya, he, uh, the Microsoft CEO, he said, we have seen in two years worth of digital transformation equivalent to two months. You can imagine this, two years of work in two months only. And this have been uh, reflected to everything. Interaction and in digital uh, economy have been troubled compared to 2018 and doubled in terms of adoption to technology. So every organization using technology, they've been almost double compared to last year. And uh, the acceleration have expanded. You can see that 90% of organizations, at least they have 50% of their workforce working from uh, from home and we expect this to last for some time or at least for many organizations that especially international who are adapting to best practices they will be fair people working from their home in a state of consuming power in energy uh, um, space whatever and let them work in their uh, own base at the end if they deliver what i want that's it. I don't need no. I, need, I don't need any more. And you know the trends are continuous. Every time Gartner uh, uh, surprises us with new with the new things, Internet of Behaviors, after Internet of Thing, and Internet of Everything, and Cloud. Now we are uh, thinking about a local cloud. Uh, it will be uh, there will be less latency more control and uh, in terms of laws and uh, regulations, AI engineering, hyper automation, everything in your organization will be automated and much more. So what we expect with these expansion everywhere in every angle and because of the impact of COVID-19, uh, this wave will continue. And it is expected to reach $1,000 billion in terms of spending. As uh, one example of uh, how much we are exposed to the internet and to the you know, technology and how much we are transformed. I remember in uh, 2000 or 1999, we had a one terabyte. It was big number of storages. Uh, you can say uh, one meter or more. Now we have will have zettabyte and zettabyte equivalent to one billion terabyte. So you can imagine in 2000 and 2025 there will be one seven one hundred seventy five zettabyte of our data of our sharing images, via voices, information, documents. Everything will be online available. This is huge. This shows how much we'll be depending on technology, as well how much there will be risk and uh, security threats. And this is continuous. We are working in different angles. Cloud is an angle, Internet of Things, uh, artificial intelligence. But the idea now, 
if we go back to the first slide, the waves are shrinking in terms of depth, or sorry, in terms of uh, width, and uh, the impact is very high. And in the coming few years, you will find it faster, shorter, and higher in terms of, in terms of impact. So if you want to be leading and continue as your leadership, you need to be working hard uh, with no sleep. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good. Thank you so much, Ms. Thank you so much, Mr. Bohaza, uh, for that wonderful uh, session. And uh, thank you so much for sparing time also to take part in the CIO 200's inaugural uh, round. As always, it's a um, pleasure having you. And I'm sure the audience also has had some key takeaways from your uh, presentation. On that note, um, uh, delegates, now it's time to introduce our Inspire 10 on 10 segment. Started in 2020, this uh, unique segment will feature global speakers from the various countries that CIO 200 is traveling to and who have implemented transformational projects in the year gone by and currently working as well. To present our first Inspire 10 on 10 segment, uh, I would like to call upon Rajiv Arora, Global Head of IT Global Hub at Siemens. Rajiv has successfully transformed organization portfolios for greenfield startups and existing functions with significant cost restructuring and ensuring organizations' future readiness with leveraging cloud computing. He also has optimized operating expenditures via shared services, consolidation, automation, offshoring, and much more. Rajiv, it's a true honor to have you with us today as a part of the World CIO 200 Inspire 10 on 10. We welcome you and the stage is all yours. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. I'm Rajiv Arora, based out of India, working for Siemens as a global head of IT, the global hub. Today, I'm here to share with you the future role of all of us as CIOs. I was just going through a study and looked at what is the role of IT in the future would look like. And if you look at across the industry, some of the industry specialists, industrialists, industrialists are saying that IT and the business would be, inter would be interwoven. That's what Bill Gates is looking at it. Look at what Satya is saying from Microsoft. He's saying that cloud would be the prominent place where all business would happen. Look at Accenture, which is in the top five consulting companies. Companies will have digital core at its cloud. Some of the CIOs of our community are sharing that 10% of the budget would be allocated to the cybersecurity. So what does it mean? It means a lot to all of us that the role of IT going forward to transform completely over a period of time. So what does the role of IT would look like for all of us? If you look at our primary job, we take care of the company strategy, especially on technology, which can serve the business strategy also. Today, some of the CIOs from our community are holding a responsible position, but in five years, two to five years from now, we expect that 66% would be decision makers in their respective industries. And their influence will continue to increase as they not only become a technology implementers, but also the architects for the new business models, for business lines and directing changes, which can help increase the top line as well as the bottom line of a company. There was a study where they're saying that the 49% of the existing CIOs could be CEOs by the year 2025. 
our CIOs will play a critical role in this huge reach. And they are expecting that they may also hold a board position. And these numbers will be very high, especially in the area of healthcare and retail, and retail which is seeing a huge growth, especially in these pandemic times. As we are also seeing that half of the CIOs are expected to hold a profit center or a PNL, especially in the area of manufacturing sector setup, where the niche technologies like AI, machine learning, AR, VR, augmented reality, and robotics play a new role to create new products that will create a new bottom line revenue for all of us. As CIOs gain expertise on solving the business problems and building profits for the industry, they are the ideal candidate for the top positions of a CIO. And that's why the 49% are the one you're looking at it. Not surprisingly, if you look at our own community, nearly 70 to 75% have been responsible to avoid a social churn, a social harm by leveraging a technology. As we all really strive towards that, what does it bring? It brings a lot of success for all the CIOs to become closer to the chief operating officers, to the chief marketing officers, so that they can enable them by using customer data, which can help them for decision making and help grow the revenue for the organizations. So in summary, what I would suggest share that the CIOs of 2025 will be more heavily invested in businesses outcome with direct responsibilities of generating revenue for all of us. So what does we need to do? There are three areas what we should as CIOs do. If you look at the number one, brace for C suite churn. So I would say refresh and sustain the business models of the company to drive and get a board seat. That can be handled by the contracted by the compliance. Mm -hmm. Second, how can you help generate more growth for the company by injecting insights, leveraging the customer data? by leveraging the niche tools like AI and machine learnings and apply data science capability to that. And third, flood like the futures by advising the boards, by building long-term business strategies to drive it out. With this three such suggestions, we feel that together we can rock the future of IT for all of us. In case you have any questions, please reach out to me. You have my contact details on the slide. With that, I would like to say thank you to all of you and enjoy the event. Thank you so much, Rajiv, for that uh, insightful presentation. Uh, like the work you have done is truly inspiring and uh, I'm sure all the CIOs who are logged in right, right now enjoyed your presentation as much as we did. Uh, thank you so much once again for being a part of the World CIO 200 uh, and we look forward to seeing you soon as well. On that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, a slight um, change in our uh, schedule. Our next speaker is experiencing some technical difficulties, so he should be joining us real soon. Uh, meanwhile, uh, why wait? Our cross-border panelists are all set and all mic'd up uh, to be uh, to come on the screen. 
So a little bit about uh, the cross-border panel before we call out the panelists. This concept again was initiated in the year 2020. Uh, the whole concept of cross-border panel of CIO 200 shot to fame in very less time. The unique flavor that this panel brings about is extraordinary. CIOs from different geographies, different countries discuss how technology has been a game changer for them and redefine in true sense that technology knows no border or boundaries. So for our first ever uh, cross-border panel of 2021, it gives me great pleasure to call upon our panelists, uh, Samuel Amenor Afri from Africa. He's the CEO of Blue Space Africa. Khalid Jalal, Senior Group ICD Manager, Gulf Aluminium Rolling Mill from our host country, Bahrain. Muni Rehmat, Executive Director and CIO at the United Insurance Company from Pakistan. The panel will be moderated by Arun Shankar, who's the editor of GEC Media Group. And on that note, I would like to welcome the panelists and hand this over to Arun. Good day, everyone, and assalamu alaikum. Well, Continuing with the success of 2020, where we hosted 104 leading CIOs in our cross-border panel discussions, we are pleased to move forward with this initiative in 2021 as well, inviting the top CIOs to participate in our cross-border panel discussions. So as part of the World C CIO 200 Roadshow 2021 Bahrain edition, and on behalf of Global CIO Forum and its sponsor partners, I welcome the panelists here with me to this cross-border panel on leadership in the post-pandemic era. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our panelists for today. Uh, they are Samuel Amanor from Africa. So he's the CEO for Blue Space Africa. So welcome, Samuel. Thank you, Aaron. Aaron. Fantastic. Khalid R. R. Jalal from Bahrain. He's the senior group ICT manager at Gulf Aluminium Rolling Mill. Welcome, Khalid. Thank you very much, Mr. Aaron. And... Uh, Last in the trio of panelists, Munir Ahmed from Pakistan, Executive Director and CIO at the United Insurance Company of Pakistan. So welcome, Thank Munir. You. Thank you, Aram. Great. So a uh, little bit of housekeeping. We will begin with three rounds of discussion with the panelists across the next 30 minutes. And to give a little bit of background about our panel, obviously we are seeing the post-pandemic recovery beginning. And businesses have been led by the technology heads. They are revamping their infrastructure and application stack, are looking at improving customer experience, getting higher returns from sales, driving business resilience and business continuity. But we're also seeing failed organizations and industries struggling, right? We're seeing consolidation, we're seeing shakeouts, we're seeing exits, and many of them can be linked to Legards in technology adoption. Hence our theme, uh, leadership in the post-pandemic recovery phase. So let's look and let's discuss with our panelists about what drives leadership, what can help businesses to uh, retain and uh, keep their leadership position in their own market segments. So great, so I'm happy to begin and let's start with the questions. I'd like to start with Samuel. So Samuel, you're based in Africa. You have a fantastic, uh, let's say, startup organization or how we like to refer to it, a Blue Space Africa. Is it a startup or is it already uh, an operational business? It's, uh, thank you. Thank you, Aran. Uh, Blue Space Africa has been in business uh, since 2015. And initially, you know, my background, I uh, basically was leading uh, the business for both EMC and Dell in, in Ghana and uh, Later on, Dell obviously acquired EMC. Uh, so I came back from the US uh, 2010, thereabout. Ghana at the time had discovered oil. And at the time, oil, any country that discovers oil is, is pretty much the focal point, right? So we led with infrastructure uh, as, a, as a, you know, a company multinational. Five years later, I resigned and we started Blue Space Africa. And the goal was, I started seeing a trend, which is basically cloud-related trends. 
and at the time Amazon and, and Microsoft and Google Cloud were quite at the infancy. So, um, so cloud was basically on my mind all the time. VMware was basically the, the word you heard in all the data center conversations. And so I said, you know what, what if we did something that was cloud related, but for the financial services ecosystem, right? Hence the name Blue Space. So if you hear Blue Space, you look at the clouds, uh, right? So it was, it was started as an infrastructure company, uh, looking at cybersecurity, looking at data center virtualization, looking at how we can take costs out of the data centers. But we realized people who are buying infrastructure, uh, the process of buying infrastructure, by the time the RFPs were done, by the time you select your vendor, you would have lost at least six to nine months. And innovation is actually very, very fast. Things are growing very fast. So you're wasting time, basically. And we have, uh, we said, you know what? Why can't African companies consume infrastructure the way the cloud was basically designed? On-demand, sure. elastic, uh, in our world, you have to ship hardware, you have to go to the customs clearing, you have to then offload, you have to buy insurance, you have to then deploy this particular asset. It takes a long time. Value is not realized in any of these processes till the customer puts application on the infrastructure as Fantastic. a business. So, so if, if I can interrupt you here, that's that's an excellent lead to, the, to my question that Sitting in, in Ghana, obviously, you've been, I think you have some of the telcos, uh, Watercom, and seen some of the others as your, as your customer. I was looking at the website. So according to you, uh, what particular application stack, or let's say, what particular IT resilience has helped some of the African companies to come through the last 18 to 24 months? If you can give me a, a more direct uh, answer to that. Go ahead, Samuel. Sure. So the, the resilience needed typically is to be able to deploy applications on demand, right? Customers need to, to have access to systems. Uh, in my customer segment, uh, they are moving from branch-based applications to offline, I mean, online. Customers come to the branch to transact with their bank uh, uh, brands. Today, the customer wants to, you know, to interact with the bank uh, online via mobile apps or USSD or web. So a bank who doesn't have basically digital uh, channels or digital uh, layers in their business and they're dealing with legacy banking applications will not be able to survive. So the first application we're seeing is that they are all going digital. They are putting a digital channel in front of their core systems. Uh, they are becoming API uh, ready to be able to inter integrate and collaborate with third parties. Uh, the FinTech ecosystem is growing in Ghana and in Nigeria in Kenya, in South Africa. So digital channels, basically on-demand deployment. Uh, cloud first is also the, the new resilient approach because you cannot wait to ship hardware anymore, right? So most of the customers are classifying their data, mission critical systems and non-mission critical systems. And then they are filtering the mission critical systems on-prem and then not too mission critical are all moving to the cloud. These are becoming resilient. This is making them resilient. The last bit of technology is being able to have cyber at all parts of your value chain, right? So at the channel layer, within the inter internet layer, within the data center, uh, cybersecurity is becoming the key. Knowing your customer no longer becomes filling some forms, but knowing what they are doing within the cyberspace, having the access management technologies in place within cyber encryption, it's also becoming a key thing that we've seen. So cybersecurity, uh, digital channels, and on-demand on cloud provisioning is what we're seeing out there to, to make them resilient. Uh, very interesting. And you've seen this across the large to medium enterprises, or are we seeing some activity on the small, small uh, businesses also? What's your take over there? Uh, our segment is really you know, the medium to large uh, financial service providers. Uh, and we're now trying to entertain some fintechs to work with us. Um, but typically, you know, it's about cost, right? And the way things work in Africa, you have to go to the board for everything to be approved. Right? So it's also taking time to make decisions. While the decision-making process is delaying, customers are moving to other brands, right? So speed of decision-making and speed of knowing what you want uh, is basically the, the, the driver. And it's mostly the medium to large enterprise. The, the entry startup community 
are basically rocking with budgets, right? So they love the cloud, AWS, Google Cloud, uh, DigitalOcean, uh, Azure. These are the, the, the tenants that these startups entry levels are going to, and they have actually started everything they're doing cloud first. Is the mid to enterprise guys that are now trying to look at the cloud as though it's a new innovation. But the, the, the startup community have already embraced the cloud. The cloud. Okay, great. Very interesting. And uh, glad you made the distinction between startups and enterprises. And obviously, a great insight based on your baseline of experience with Dell EMC. And, you know, I think you you started your career as a storage specialist. So great insights over there, uh, Samuel. So I'd like Thank to come you. to you. Yeah, I'd like to come to you now, Khalid. So Khalid, you also have uh, quite a, a long baseline in uh, Gulf Aluminium Rolling Mill. Before that, Zurich Insurance. And currently, you are a board member of the... Uh, international group of artificial intelligence based out of Bahrain, right? Uh, uh, quite a varied experience. Am I right about that, Khalid? That's true, yes. Fantastic. So uh, obviously, uh, these last 18 months are really challenging for businesses. And again, whether you want to be specific to your organization or from your learning, what uh, success stories have you seen in businesses in terms of their applications, their technologies that's helped them to get through this last 18 to 24 so absolutely challenging uh, situation. Go ahead, Khalid. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart. And it was just lovely hearing from our colleague Samuel what they do in their respective country. Now, I represent a manufacturing company in Bahrain, Toads in Bahrain, but our operations are worldwide. We operate out of Bahrain, USA, Australia, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. So the spectrum is very large and global. Now it comes to uh, technology. We cannot operate without having the right technology in place, either for us or for our subsidiaries. Now we have an ERP system, which is doing the, the standard ERP operations, but as a plant uh, manufacturing organization, we have in-house developed application as well, which is taking care of all our plant in terms of the integration, in terms of integration with the plant, the uh, you know the, the different accessories which you have inside the plant and so on. So the whole plant is automated right now in terms of the technology. We also have other applications that are developed on .NET base, which is supporting applications to our entire to our entire operations of the of the globe. Now coming to uh, you know, our friend Samuel also mentioned the cloud side. Cloud is something in Bahrain as we always think as cloud as a first policy. Cloud first is mandatory for all of us. Now the government has initiated an initiative of introducing the AWS in Bahrain. So AWS services are already in Bahrain, the data center is in Bahrain. So we look at what services we can port on AWS so that's easy, easily accessible from anywhere around the world. We also use Microsoft Azure, Office 365, AWS Cloud Services along with Citrix so our subsidiaries can, they can connect to us. We don't need to be in the office for our business operations except the operators who are operating the physical plant. They need to be inside the plant. Otherwise, completely it's automated and we can work completely from a remote side. Now, when we say uh, we have automated a lot, that means we need to have a lot of good framework also to be in place. We use the security framework of the ISO 27001 and the business continuity framework of ISO 22301 uh, to make sure we are following the right practices for in securing our services and access to our platform. But it includes not only the cyber security, it also includes the physical security, damages, theft, and so on. Of course, we, being a local company operating you know, throughout the globe, we need to make sure that whatever we do is aligned and accepted by the regulations in Bahrain as well as the countries we are operating. So we make sure that whatever we do is also considering the framework and the regulations from around the world. So that's what we do, and that been helping us in our uh, journey. This pandemic, we the because we were prepared much in advance, being a global organization. It has helped us a lot compared to other organizations which were local and not very much ready. I think it's important also for anyone to think why technology is helping them. They should not think technology is a cost center anymore. It should be as a business enabler. That's what we are following from 
long ago, and that's what is helping us in adding value to our operations. Very interesting, Khalid. I just want one uh, clarification there. So this 18 to 24, 18 months, uh, was there any particular area where you re-looked it, where you reinvested, restructured? For example, you mentioned about the plant operations. And obviously, we had all these interruptions between people movement. Did you actually have to enhance the automation? Did you have to bring in more of uh, industrial IoT? Did you have to look at more of digital digitalization of the industrial operation? Were there any specific areas where you had to relook at, at technology? Go ahead. Let me tell you the basic thing. When this issue started in Bahrain, the initial impact we had is the availability of the laptops. It's simple. It's the basic entry level. There was no, there was no stock available in Bahrain because everyone rushed and purchased it. Now, for us to work from remote area or work from home or from a safe area, we need to have at least a laptop to work from. And that was the biggest challenge which we had in terms of having the inventory available. Now, in terms of our ongoing journey, because we had a long-term plan of what we want to do in our plan, we were already equipped with all the necessary uh, automation and integration. We have taken a process in which every year we take up digital transformation as one of our key projects and we keep building on it. Now, I'll give an example of, for example, when we have the, the way scale, all the information which is there in the way scale, we have multiple way scale by the, across the plan. All the information are automatically with the help of the IoT processes comes to our uh, ERP system and we analyze how things are working and what are the areas where we need to focus on any maintenance is required that we get the, all, the, all the alerts and the signals. The movement of our the, the vehicles from the, the main gate and what, how much material comes in, how much material goes out is all captured online with the help of various devices and tools and the sensors. So these are things which we implement year after year to make sure everything is uh, in line with the industry and the technology is up to date. Great, fantastic. So uh, uh, very interesting to note that your organization was proactive and uh, on an annual uh, cycle, you really look at technologies, keep it operational and obviously the supply chain challenges with regard to the laptop, I'm quite sure that happened in other areas. So Munir, uh, over to you now. So essentially, if I, if I see your background, you're actually a PhD, I think, in computer sciences or specialized in some particular areas, and you seem to love cybersecurity and, yes. of course, lo long baseline with United Insurance Company. Am I right about that? Go ahead. Correct. Well, uh, United Insurance is a general insurance company. We are giving insurance services, uh, also the health insurance services. <clears throat> so uh, when the pandemic started, uh, last year in the March, lockdown was imposed in the March and, you know, people were getting COVID-19 positive and uh, also, you know, we had a different scenario that now we have to allow our staff to take the laptop or computers to their, their homes to work from home. Uh, different, uh, you know, managers and peoples, they are working from villages, they had difficulty connecting to the, you know, VPN services. So what we did is uh, that initially we established a, uh, a WhatsApp group immediately, started coordinating everyone, uh, use the Zoom like we are using now. Uh, so first of all, we connected our all managers using our voice over IP connection to the head office. Because, you know, we are, uh, you know, an insurance company, we have to give services to the customers. So customers are calling, for example, someone is getting sick, now he will need an hospitalization help and a pre-authorization from the United Insurance. So of course he will be calling to the head office and the people are not sitting in the office. So what we did is first of all, in the first week we established our communication. We allowed our managers, peoples and call center agents to connect to the uh, voice over IP server and start answering the calls. Let me tell you a very interesting thing. Uh, first couple of days, uh, even me and my IT professionals, we were giving the services to the customers. So we were accessing because, because of our background, because we are related to the IT, so we know the system. Actually, United Insurance Company have in-house software development. So our ERP and all the systems are being developed by us. Uh, there is a subsidiary company called United Software and Technologies. 
So uh, the start was like this, that we, we took all the measures and you know, the, 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 the most important thing was that our branches were able to connect to the head office and the head office staff was not you know, used to of connecting to these services. So we have to make a task force that you know, one IT guy, he's explaining to the manager how he will connect the VPN and how he will access the software. And you know, as an insurance company, our document required you know, signatures for the policyholders, ap uh, approvals, so at the same time, we started, you know, upgrading our documents, the, the digital signature, uh, uh, the, the documents, those are printing online is the, in this period are not required any signatures. So it was the major change. We have to took our software development team into it. And uh, somehow like in, in a two week, we were into a normal course of action, started giving the services and uh, we cannot say 100% operational, but somehow 80, 90% we were operational. Great, very interesting and uh, excellent point you mentioned over there because the customers are engaging face to face and there's a voice exchange. The most critical part of your of your setup was to get the, uh, let's say verbal communication going uh, rather than let's say information because the, the business has to continue with customers, correct Mr. Munir? Yes, correct. Yes, yes. You know, once the people uh, take the devices to the home, uh, you know, we started, uh, you know, uh, receiving the threats, you know, the cybersecurity and data privacy. Uh, of course, you know, the uh, the power user of the head office, now they are sitting in their homes. Uh, someone have, you know, access level to the, to until to the manager level. So we have to carefully see the logs. We have to check uh, how the system is being accessed. You know, a lot of vulnerabilities were, you know, reported on our analyzer. So we deeply, uh, our cybersecurity team deeply worked on uh, these issues. Uh, and, you know, all, all the world, you know, faced these challenges like we faced in United Insurance. Very interesting. So obviously, uh, clearly some, some measures that were taken to ensure the business was resilient and we could continue operations and obviously ensure that you know financial stability was built in over there. So Samuel, let's uh, go forward with a very interesting po point which Munir has just mentioned where he had to uh, literally uh, play multiple roles, you know, act like a customer service agent also, also work with business, you know, enable them, plus of course do his role as, as technology. And I think what we have seen uh, in the past 18 months is that uh, technology heads have engaged much more closely with uh, business. You know, in order yeah. to make this this work, it's not just appreciation, but actually, you know, getting embedded with them. What's been your experience in uh, on this particular aspect of business and technologies uh, heads working much more closer, much more like peers? Go ahead. So, so the the uh, I think the Khalid was mentioning technology is no longer a tool; it's actually now the enablement, right, in businesses. So that, that decision, uh, the, the board in most of the banks and insurance companies uh, have to recognize that the, the new innovation in their business can never happen if technology decisions are treated like, you know, it's not, it's not significant, right? Uh, in the past, human resource was very critical, uh, but it, technology was not looked as though it was that critical. It was more of a supporting tool. We need some laptops. We need some cables. We need some data center. We need generators. Now, technology is the thing. Uh, the thing we've seen in terms of alignment is most of the technology heads were not akin to the business outcomes, right? They didn't understand the objectives of business. All they knew was we need 50 servers. We need... Uh, 100 laptops we need, they didn't understand the risk and compliance components uh, to, the, to the impact of the business. They knew we have to buy software, you know? So that alignment uh, is coming at a point where there has to be more close-knit relationship. Uh, the, the, the walls have to be broken uh, where the IT people sit and where the business people sit. Now you have to, if you look at the Silicon Valley companies, you have an open floor plan there has to be more fostering of integrate uh, collaboration, but we don't have that because of pan the pandemic. Now it's all Zoom calls, right? So you have to you have to sort of intentionally create these work streams where the business is walking people to what the business processes are. 
So most of the companies that we're looking at who have uh, embarked on digital transformation, they're dealing with two key problems. Uh, the first one is business process analysis. They have to be able to measure step-by-step step all the processes involved in delivering service, right? And today, a lot of them were kept in uh, hard paper, A4 sheets, you have to print this, you have to print that. Like Munir said, even the digital signature to transform into a digital signature phase of the business is very critical, it's very tough, right? Because there's a lot of fraud, there's a lot of fake documents that can be you know, photoshopped and, and sent out there. Signatures can now be automatically photoshopped, right? So how do you, how do you digitize the business process? How do you bring IT to understand the impact of any sort of falsehood in the, in the engagement process while wanting to go digital? So that's one of the things they, the first thing is that alignment of business processes. The second thing has to be the actual capability of the teams, right? Uh, oftentimes you think skill set is, uh, is something to joke with. The IT asset base outside of the engineers, uh, if you're a company that is led by vendors, you, your business is actually at very much risk, right? So the talent pool, in, in the company becomes very, very critical. And an audit has to be done, a matrix of who knows what, how many people in the company has uh, digital transformation skills, i.e. AI, i.e. machine learning, i.e. artificial intelligence, i.e. cloud, i.e. cybersecurity. How many people really have certifications? How many people really know how those technologies impact the business, right? So that cross-functional assessment between the business guys and the technology guys is very critical. It's missing. And if we do not, as, as IT practitioners, business owners, if we don't go to that methodic, uh, methodological audit or diagnosis of the skill set, what will happen? A lot of the vendors will come to your company and preach to you what their solution would do, but they will not be able to integrate that technology into your work streams because they don't know your business. All right, so that's where the IT guy is coming in. Understood. So, so let's let's take a break over here. I think your point is very valid. One is, of course, that technology uh, specialists in Africa have learned to be more responsible about the outcomes, and second is about the the skill sets. Very interesting point. Uh, I can see we're going to be having to reduce the time on the answers because we do want to go for one more round. So, Khaled, over to you now. Obviously, a very rich organization in terms of processes and uh, and other engagements. Any specific peer-to-peer -peer interactions with business that took place in order to in increase the resilience of the organization in the last 18 months? Go ahead, please. See, in this world, be it a workplace or it's home, you're in your friend circle. Nothing works better unless you work as a team. And when you work as a team, basically you are working towards your success, right? That's what I believe in. And as a CIO or a technology enabler or a consultant, it's our role to educate or to make our management aware of what is available, which can help the business. If you go and tell them this particular technology is I want to invest without having proper justification of how it's going to help the business, chances are we'll not be able to go forward. And that's where the, the disconnect comes between the technology and the other peers in the organization. So the first thing is we need to make sure whatever we do is a proper strategy set up in the organization from the beginning of the term or the year that what is the strategy which you want to follow? Now, strategy is done. Step number two is help engage our business users because change is always difficult in any organization. So when you have a strategy, we make sure that our business users or at least the key top users are aware of the changes what we want to plan for the whole term. So they're part of our budget preparation process, the part of our strategy process. And we know since they all agreed to it, it's going to, it's going to happen, right? Let's put it in this way. Third thing is then we go and look at the technology because technology in today's world, everything is available. It's how we pick and choose to customize it for ourselves, right? So strategy, the getting the users buy in and getting the right technology available and how we want to use it. Now, when you talk about technology, the multiple things which again comes into the picture. Now, are we talking about the digital transformation? If that is example we take, what are the areas which you want to transform to digital format and then how we want to use it? 
was the purpose of that and that's what we need that's what basically drives and help the management to be your partner to implement the your strategy in the organization the certain things also come from outside the organization now when we talk about the cloud computing is basically a requirement from the government side that we should go to the cloud wherever possible they do audit they do follow up with this so the government is also taking a lot of interest in terms of the organization's growth and of course economical uh, growth in the country so that's something we also look, look into the picture now third thing being a global organization we also want we always want to see how our operations is progressing how our finance are, are being uh, progressing how the operations team are processing the the respective uh, delivery of productions so that makes that is really critical for us to have everything in a digital format and improve on digital transformation year after year in terms of encouraging the management and getting their buy in we also showcase and we also go out and look for the award sessions and we promote our activities which we do to different organization and we try to get in some awards from outside on digital transformation or the best projects delivered in the organization in the respective segment we are in which is manufacturing so they also see the value and the benefit that it is not that what we do is a waste but what we do is really appreciated by the team and even by the outsiders and that makes us unique from compared to others and that's how we could build a huge connection between ourselves to go forward in the role thank you a very interesting khalid i especially like the part about how uh, all the 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 whole management plus the organization plans for the changes i think uh, if a lot of time is spent on understanding and planning for the changes the technology rolls out much more smoothly so very interesting points over there khalid and i always uh, say one more thing i always say one more thing in in this particular 18 months we're talking about especially this is very a uh, good time which has brought the cfos and cios in one platform and they become very good friends earlier it used to be challenge to go to cfos asking for extra budget but now because of the the close connection you know it becomes very easy to go and get additional budgets also just a small hint interesting i think both sides have learned how to uh, talk to each other much better and uh, with, with for the benefit of the organization so many uh last answer in this round and then we do move to a much faster round so many uh, your impressions on what made the difference from the rest of the organization in terms of peer to peer benefits how did the relationships change a uh, quick answer from you there many go ahead okay so once uh, our operational uh, operations were online uh, so we started picking the things uh, to to you know fast the process so what we did is that we allowed our you know branches and network to use our mobile applications for example i will give an example that for motor insurance uh, we allowed our customers and branches to take the video for a pre inspection we are insuring because you know we are insurance company so if we are giving you know document uh, with the digital signature there will be fraudulent activities and there will be a lot of claims coming so now our time was to make sure to uh, to stop the fraudulent activities so what we did is we we you know quickly start processing our claims using machine learning and deep learning and you know the pre inspection images and post Uh, inspection images were compared together we started building the model and also the fraud detection in the health claims like for example we are getting you know a lot of claims uh, uh, from different hospitals from different clients so what we are doing them we are comparing them with the icd standards that are actually this medicine is for that uh, patient or not so uh, these model helped us you know process you know uh, our claim processing and also the fraud detection and also uh, what we did is that the verification process of the policies what we did is that we placed immediately uh, you know a couple of urls for the policy holder so that they can verify that their information they are getting the original policy from the main company and also what we did is we allowed them to renew for example if someone is not renewing the policy in 15 days so it policy will get cancelled so we allowed this process online using our mobile app and our you know online interface so this was uh, after you know settling down the things operations online and then we focused on the uh, machine learning and also image processing and digital signatures 
interesting o- over there. So who was your best friend uh, after you introduced all this fraud detection? Was it again the CFO or was it the uh, top uh, management or who, of course, who actually? Of course, the CFO and the top management, because, you know, once, once you are saving, you know, uh, a lot of claims, actually you are, you know, uh, increasing the profit of the company and our insurance company, you know, it depends on, there is no problem to pay, you know, the genuine claims, but if you are paying a fraudulent claims, uh, of course, your bottom line of the company will, uh, you know, go to losses, of course. Uh, sure, I'm, I'm quite sure the chartered accountants and other auditors were also equally impressed. So let's move to the last round and we are actually uh, way, way uh, running out of time, but very important round and let's see how we can quickly answer this in two minutes per person. So uh, all, all three of you have used technology intensively. We've gone through a lot of experiences and obviously we are now focused on the recovery and the future that lies ahead, let's say 12, 24 months. How do we actually catch the next wave of innovation keep ahead of the competitors, make sure that we are not again disrupted or caught on the wrong foot by the next set of challenges. So Munir, I want to start with you, uh, reverse way, your take in the next 24 months, which technologies are you going to leverage extensively to boost the leadership profile of your organization? Will it be AI? Will it be VOIP? Will it be security? Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, we are focusing now uh, because, you know, we are a very old company, uh, more than 60 years. Uh, now we are learning from the past data that uh, what customer base we have. Uh, we, we are building, you know, machine learning models on that, that which type of cards we are getting for insurance, what type of claims we are getting. So we are learning that that and last year I have started my PhD only because of this to, to learn the data. So we are focusing big data analytics. And, you know, uh, in, in this 18 month, what we have learned is that the weakest challenge was humans, we ourselves. Like, for example, I am getting COVID uh, positive, someone is not uh, connecting to the internet, and there is no, you know, training and awareness. So what we are focusing now, that whatever we have built in the last 18 months, we are, you know, training to not only level one, level two, level three, even on the level four. Uh, because if I, if we take an example today, I, I am COVID positive, my uh, number two is COVID positive, my number three is COVID positive. So we are, you know, the weakest link. So we are expanding our trainings uh, to our staff. We are getting them awareness about the usage of the, you know, new systems, new reports, and also giving them awareness about the data privacy and cybersecurity. This is, in my opinion, is the most important thing that we should work in one team and we explain all of our team members that how to react in this situation. Like, for example, uh, as I mentioned in, uh, in the start, that I had to work for a couple of departments. So IT has to be enabler with other departments. And of course, other departments have to support vice versa to IT, that what, what exactly they need. So I think uh, that the trainings, uh, big data analytics, and uh, artificial intelligence is our take uh, to move forward. Very interesting. And I especially like that, that, that initiative where to go to level four, because after all, uh, as you said, you're investing in yourself by doing the PhD. The better you know the technology, the better the returns. And obviously for an insurance company, big data is so critical you know, to get the algorithms of purchase. Khaled, moving to, to your side again, your take on the next 24 months, where would you look at uh, picking out technologies important for your organization. Go ahead. I think for any organization, the next step is to take a step back and do a complete post-mortem of what happened in the last 18 months. What plans they have put for, for their uh, growth and how what has worked, what has not worked. What are the plans which is there in the paper in terms of the business continuity and resilience, whether it is actually working or not working going forward. But if you don't revise it, if you don't do the complete post-mortem on it, in a true manner, not just writing a piece of paper for the compliance purpose, but actually should be working model, then you will end up with the same issue. So if you don't want to have the same issues, the first step is to do a complete post-mortem and see what is happening. Now, I see a lot of organizations, they have uh, made the mandatory thing that in the organization chart, they introduce a role called digital strategist or digital transformation expert or something to do with the digital. Because now they have realized that this is the way going forward for them to continue the business. So digital transformation is becoming 
the focus area for most of the organization. With the digital transformation uh, in the picture, they're also trying to look at the artificial intelligence and the robotics in the form of, they just started with the, the RPA processes, automating a lot of uh, operations with the help of the RPA and the bots. So that's uh, becoming very famous and organization like us, we need to invest a lot on the bots to make sure things are more and more automated. We reduce the dependency on the human and the human errors, especially being a, a manufacturing organization where things are a bit risky in certain areas, it's better let the bot operates in those areas. Cloud first is definitely the thing which everybody should uh, focus and uh, work and invest towards it. Now, our friend uh, Mani just mentioned about the the large data being an insurance company, yes, large data is there, it's always been there. It's time to promote more and more the business intelligence and the reporting type of thing. With the help of Power BI, it's become very close to the finance people and the data analyst. They can use such tools to reduce the pain and the efforts from the IT team to the business side because now they can see the data the way they want to see, they can visualize it and they can develop more business sense out of the data then an IT department preparing some specific uh, reports for them. I think for a manufacturing company is to invest the, on, the, on the digital transformation, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, even dig, uh, the, uh, the 3D printing is something uh, all the manufacturing companies should look into it in order to reduce costs and have a lot of inventory readily available to them. It all depends by when the true manner of 3D printing will be available for manufacturing, Power BI, and should focus on industry 4.0 as soon as possible and then go beyond that. Great, fantastic. Uh, especially like the last part about you reinforcing 3D printing. Uh, yes, uh, very correct. All manufacturing organizations should be looking at that prototype. So Samuel, you're last now and your, your, your impression of which technologies, of course, you are looking at FinTech and specific sectors, but your impression of which technologies will make a difference in the next 24 months, go ahead. Now, uh, the, 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 I have a framework called the three P's, uh, people, process, and products, right? Uh, the, the technologies that pre pre will prevail in the next 24 months, uh, I'm looking at customers being close, uh, companies being closer to their customers, right? Because you don't see these customers, you have to have a deeper affinity. Your people have to have a deeper affinity to these customers. And the key technologies we're looking at is customer experience management, uh, being able to have tools, analytical tools, uh, to be able to go out there and know what your customers are thinking. People are now putting feedback on Twitter. People are putting feedback on WhatsApp groups and Instagram. Uh, companies today have to be able to understand uh, the most critical aspect of their business is the people, is the, is the customers that they sell to. And you want to know what they think about your brand. They want to know what they think about your service delivery. So customer experience management is very, very key. Uh, the second one is your processes, right? Uh, it looks like because we're virtual, the, the, the opportunity to come in a boardroom and, and sit and ideate and brainstorm, those things are going away. So what will help is documenting business processes and understanding what key technologies are going to be able to help you document them, measure them, because you can't do RPA without knowing your processes, right? You have to be able to, you know, pick a company and say, okay, how many processes do we have in this organization? Treating the processes as though they are transactions, right? And putting a number uh, that this particular engineering company or this bank, we run about 3,000 processes to deliver this business and be able to measure that and then putting your RPAs and things on top. So this sort of brings you to what we call the low code, no code era, where you're now putting things in steps, right? You're putting things in, in phases and ideating, and creating frameworks to allow any department to know what those processes are that governs those departments, whether it's the customer side, whether it's the product side, whether it's the compliance side, finance side, all of this has to be now documented and visualized. And the last one is products, right? Building an innovative product, uh, I think, is what makes a company different. Uh, the way we build, the way we engineer, the way we design, uh, we in Blue Space today, we have a, a, a capacity building arm called the Blue Space Innovation Hub, 
we're basically allowing corporates, the banks and the financial institutions to understand what makes these startups different, what makes Uber different, what makes uh, you know, Deliveroo different, what makes Tesla different, what are the product design principles that companies are imbibing into their new way of doing business. And we're taking them through the innovative processes, design thinking processes. So product design have to be re-looked at in the next 24 months. You can't deliver education product the same way you deliver today because it's changed, right? So the same way financial service providers, uh, manufacturing providers, uh, insurance providers, you have to re-look at how you deliver the product, how you build it, I do you have customer involvement in your product design or you're just designing things because that's what you think they need. So product design, product innovation is very, very powerful. And that's what we, we believe will sustain the next 24 months. So in summary, your customers, their business process documentation and, and mappings. And then the last bit is your product design has to be innovative. It can't be yesterday's ideas and products. Thank you. Sure. So uh, Samuel, thanks very much for the, that was a, a great list of best practices. I especially like the, the recommendation on low code, no code, great stuff for, for Africa and other parts of the world. So absolutely fascinating discussion. And I wish we had even a couple of minutes more to go through a few more things, but we're really running out of time here. And we have the next session also due to start. So with that, I would like to thank all of you and great insights coming from three different sites from the Pakistan from Bahrain and from Africa, a good and really healthy cross-border discussion which we had over there. And uh, with that, I'd like to come to the end of this cross-border panel discussion. So on behalf of Global CIO Forum, the World CIO 200 sponsor partners, and the panelists here, uh, Samuel Amanor, uh, Khalid Jalal, and Munir Ahmad, I'd like to thank all the online attendees for sitting through this 30 plus minutes of absolutely engaging discussion. Look forward to seeing you once again. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Take care. Well, what a great, great panel that was. Indeed, very insightful. And, you know, like as we uh, begin the cross border with, that's a true flavor of what the cross border panel brings along, as you all could see different geographies, different perspectives, but the vision is singular. Uh, thank you, Arun, for moderating this beautiful panel and taking us through the thoughts of all the CIOs who joined in. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all in person very soon. Um, thank you, panelists, for taking our time and uh, joining us today. On that note, uh, it's time to call upon our next uh, speaker from Bahrain. Uh, Shibu Ibrahim, he's the head of IT for Bahrain Duty Free. Uh, Shibu joined Bahrain Duty Free in 2011 and uh, he's an accomplished senior professional with a highly successful background in IT management, IT process improvement and IT op operations. Prior to joining Bahrain Duty Free, he also worked with Agility Logistics as the IT manager, wherein he was he heading up the IT organizations and systems development. He has also worked over a 14-year period in Oman, India, UAE, UK, and various IT roles and companies. So, uh, Shibu, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. Welcome, and the stage is all yours. Thank you all uh, for this uh, invitation that is given. Um, one uh, just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Shibu Abraham, Head of Information Technology for Bahrain Duty Free. Uh, it's a great honor and a privilege that uh, uh, to be part of the CIO um, uh, and invitation. And uh, thank you uh, for uh, for this time. Um, I just wanted to give a brief about the travel retail industry. What's happening in travel retail? Um, it is a very a travel retail, as you know. It's a very unicity and it is very dynamic and that whatever we try to introduce, we have a customer, we have the unique customer who purchases when they travel. So that this is this is our best selling point. This is where we introduce the information technology. We introduce the new technology enhancements for the customer to enjoy the best and give them the best shopping experience. Um, to, to be precise, um, 
uh, that Bahrain had a new terminal, uh, US dollar 1.1 billion uh, uh, investment of a new terminal opened up this year, 2021 in January. Well, it's a big question mark when everyone might be thinking why this year? Well, we went through a pandemic last year, 2020, and this year has been a remarkable year again. Uh, uh, you know, we were just, we, it's not that we've all settled and we started this, but the country had a great vision. The leaders of this country had a great vision and that they, uh, they, they trusted that, you know, opening the terminal at this point in time will create a small momentum in business. And I wanted to say that, you know, it is a state of the art, one of the best uh, airports uh, in this uh, in the region um, uh, for Bahrain. We have around 5,000 square uh, plus uh, square meters of uh, you know uh, duty free that is spread across. It has been spread across. It's double the size. It's I think it's four times the size of what we had in our previous terminals. And uh, it is spread across in different categories. It is liquor, tobacco, confectionery, um, fashion, jewelries, uh, toys. Uh, you name it. I mean, all these areas are widely spread across just to make sure the customer, whenever he walks in, will have all that they want to have the best of the brands that they can pick up and uh, uh, and for their choice. So from the terminal perspective, that's where we are. And on the technology aspect, uh, well, we are into, um, as, as you all know, that we have rolled out a, 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 a locker system uh, for our customers here in Bahrain. What we've done is anytime when a customer travels uh, through the airport and he does a shopping in duty free, imagine he picks up 10 items and the five items of that he decides that he just does not want to take it along with him. And uh, we want to give the customer a different experience. The customer can book a locker. I mean, instantly the system will book a locker for them. And the locker system is such a way that it's integrated with our ERP system. So if five items can be kept in the locker and whenever the customer is back, he can automatically get an SMS saying that his item is for collection. He does not even have to go to the arrival duty free. He just have to go to the locker because he's already done the purchasing while the travel. So it gives a unique experience for the customer. The customer is out in the uh, arrivals, goes to the locker, picks his item and walks away. And it's it's a it's a completely, uh, I think it's, it's first of its kind that we have done here for our customers. And uh, I wanna say our, all our lockers are fully booked uh, and it is uh, it has been widely used um, uh, because uh, it's a free service. There is no charge for this, but it's like just that the customer gets uh, the wow benefit out of it. We want to create a journey, uh, give a customer a different experience, a wow experience in everything that we do. Um, then it's we have divided uh, our strategy uh, into two: IT enhancements, digital transformation, and IT infrastructure. Uh, digital transformation, as you know, is evolving greatly. I mean, this is, uh, there are so much of technologies that are coming into picture, AI, AR, and uh, retail industry is, is kind of a bit uh, switching on which one to take, how to take, how to balance it. Well, let me tell you, from my experience, um, we've been very uh, picky on certain uh, technologies aspects, how it will benefit duty free as such, how the travel retail will benefit out of it. Digital transformation, for some people, it is just taking paper and converting it into a system device. Well, that's not what it is all about. It's beyond that. It's much beyond that. For example, uh, we have uh, we have a tie with Microsoft and we are utilizing their greatest tools of Microsoft uh, Power Automate, Power Apps, um, some of the applications that we have done is completely enhanced into it so that, you know, uh, the, the, the staffs get the maximum benefit out of it. In the end user gets the maximum benefit out of it. So no more noting down the stocks and papers or handhelds. It is much beyond. It has transformed much beyond. So we get to know the live stocks. We get to know the live inventory of our stocks. Uh, we get to know what has been sold, which area it has been sold, what's the value of that. Everything is on happening right now on a click of a button. And uh, this has helped the management to take drastic steps, drastic uh, uh, strategic steps to enhance the business in a much faster scale. For example, we want to know, we, we know what is the best selling when a Lufthansa flight takes off. We know what is the best selling when, 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 when uh, welfare takes off the kitchen. Uh, uh, you know, so we understand the customer behavior and our promotions are currently set in such a manner that customer-centric, customer's preference, customer's choice is 
considered at a first glance. And that's how we have evolved our business. And, uh, you know, this is how technology is evolving in the travel retail industry. And uh, uh, which is a great, great, great asset for all of us. And we've been, we, 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 we've been, our entire team, the management has been working hard to see how the customer experience can be enhanced. The other one that we also look into is the in-store experience. For example, for uh, wines and cigars, as you all know, these categories have a lot of description and uh, people want to know. Earlier days, people used to just pick one wine and walk away. But nowadays, people are very, uh, product information is so important for that. So all our labels, all our, uh, uh, all our shelf edge labels has got a QR code. And you scan the QR code, it gives you the description of the product where that wine was uh, uh, produced, what is the ingredients behind the wine, how that wine is being formulated, what is the age of the wine, everything is so detailed. So the customer gets the complete e-catalog on his mobile when he scans the QR code with the information. So if he wants to do a comparison between what is a seasonal wine and which one to take on, it, it, it's, it's, on a, it's, it's on the palm of his hand. So it's a unique experience for, again, for a customer that we have done. Uh, it's the same way for cigar. Cigar is a very different, uh, uh, a different product to itself. It's a vast product to learn by itself. So customer wants to know the, in, uh, the, the ring size, the, the product uh, information, all those informations have been captured on a just of a click of your phone when you scan the QR code. So some of the in-store experiences are different when we introduce in the new terminal how the shopping is evolved. Now we are also looking into the payment gateways. We are working closely with the payment acquirer here in Bahrain to give our customers the one point of connection where they, they don't have to waste time. Uh, they have all the uh, phone, they have Apple Pay, they have today, um, uh, you know, different payment gateways that they, they can use. Uh, we have benefit here in Bahrain. Uh, and, you know, uh, it, is, it has made life so easy for customers that the contact list was introduced. And uh, uh, so uh, during the pandemic time, one of the biggest worry for the customer was uh, they don't want to touch any devices, they don't want to use. So contact list really helped us. And this, all technology involvement happened with the help of the payment acquirer. We work closely with them so that such an experience can be given to the customer. And this was, uh, again, a very, uh, uh, very good initiative um, that was worked between two different parties along a bit duty free along, along the side. Well, during the pandemic time, again, uh, as you know, the aviation industry was one of the biggest hit that has taken. taken but we duty free had the best time again. We look things in a very positive manner. We introduced the e-commerce, we introduced the home delivery. We did uh, that so that the customer gets again the best. I mean, it was a different experience altogether uh, for the customer. We were, we were looking how the stocks can be depleted. And I should say our e-com really took off really took off in such a manner, the customer gets best of the promotions buying through e-com and, uh, and home delivery was very quick uh, as when they wanted, they could select the time and we would deliver them at home. Well, that was again on the e-commerce side that we have uh, taken drastic steps uh, to evolve the business. So again, to uh, cut short, the, these are some of the new technologies that we are looking into. And we are now slowly looking into AI. We are slowly looking into AR, um, how we can slowly bring this into our customer experience so that things will move forward in a much better scale. Uh, with this, I just want to thank you all for listening to me patiently. And uh, we look forward that a lot of more enhancements, more technological uh, uh, scalings will happen and travel, in, travel retail industry will not be left behind. It will scale up to a much greater uh, level. Thank you all.
طبعا خدمة الشوبن كوليكت مع السوق البحرين تحت تحصل أنا أتسوق من كل الماركات اللي موجودة عندهم اللي اللي معروفة عندهم وهذه الخدمة في صار فيها تطور ملحوظ من الابلكيشن الجديد مالهم وهذه الابلكيشن طبعا يسهل لي العملية من ناحية الوصول في في المطار فلما اوصل على طول يجيني مسج يذكرني ان في عندي مشتريات وهذه المشتريات اول ما اوصل عندهم هني في في المحل مالهم في القادمون في عندهم الابلكيشن في هذا الابلكيشن كل اللي علي ان انا بس امسح الرصيد وراح يعطيني او يفتح لي الخزنه اللي موجوده فيها المشتريات مالتي. فهذه طبعا الخدمه تسهل علي ان انا ما اشيل معي الارهاب ان انا الارهاب ما تاخذ من عندي مساحه في نفس الوقت فخدمه جدا حلوه وانصح فيها وسالوا عنها. طبعا مع افتتاح المطار الجديد ابتدينا سيستم جديد اللي هو سيستم شوب اند كوليكت اوتوميتد سيستم ما على المسافر الا الحضور وابراز الرصيد وسكن وراح يفتح اللوكر طبعا فرق عن السيستم القديم مع المطار القديم انه كان هناك تبرز تبرز الرصيد حق الموظف الموظف يروح داخل الستور ويبحث عن الايتم ويمكن ياخذ له وقت تاخير بالنسبه حق ال المسافر ونفس الوقت تاخير حق الموظف. فمع هاي السيستم طبعا كل شيء صار فاست وسريع واوتوميتد. Thank you so much, Shibu, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, it's it's indeed really great to see how uh, Bahrain Duty Free has. adapted all the latest technologies and how you know like the entire e-commerce uh, space has been transformed by your side i'm sure the audience also enjoyed it as much as we did uh, thank you once again for coming on board and uh, sharing your valuable time with us uh, we look forward to seeing you soon as well thank you all right uh, delegates it's uh, now time for our partner keynote on 2021 and beyond technology outlook and to present this session i would like to call upon ahmed farid territory account manager in fblox to come and talk about how the company has been transforming the tech landscape in bahrain ahmed is a service sales expert with 15 years of experience at uh, main system integrators in kuwait bahrain and oman market He is very well connected with the government, banking, oil, and education sectors. Ahmed, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. The stage is all yours. Hello, good afternoon. I hope you are enjoying CIO 200 event today, as I am actually doing. So, digital transformation. Is it just a word we say, or is it an optional path organizations can choose to take or leave? or is it a survival mandatory pass organization each and every organizations need to take it to survive in today's world this is ahmed farid territory account manager from infoblox i'm here today will speak to you for around 15 minutes i will tell you a short story about digital transformation and how it affects your life okay so our agenda for today will be why customers are embracing digital why it is important for organizations to shift to digital life why edge is very important and interesting what are the challenges that facing security and operational teams in each and every organization and finally what is the solution how we can fix and mitigate those challenges okay we have different and multiple business drivers leads organizations and force organizations to shift to the digital life customer experience is the most important point organizations wants to give their customer better experience to retain their existing customer base and get new ones competition is very tough we are in a world that 
customers now can, can find out all the information and know everything about each organization so, so they can know you very well before they dealing with they deal with you so to be a com in a competitive position in the markets you need to have a better customer experience you need to have also the, the availability the agility and the easiness to to penetrate and go to new markets as fast as it could possibly be so you need to shift your branches sometimes you need to shift your model of business you need to change the locations the countries according to the situations and how the economy is going so this is another business driver as well so and of course the cost cost is very, is very important factor to all the organizations you need to control the efficiency and productivity of your provided services to your customer to achieve this we have some technology drivers, technical drivers. What are the trends in the technology right now? All our applications, majority of our applications are tending to be on cloud. We have software as a service. Most of the applications are being hold, uh, are being published from the cloud, uh, even Azure, um, AWS, Microsoft, Google, or whatever. So some organizations are, being, are adapting multi-cloud uh, environment software defined network is also very important machine uh, machine learning automation artificial intelligence or all, all those new technology it is actually it is not new anymore but for some organizations you need to adapt it more they need to depend on it to have the agility and they have to the flexibility in applying their new applications every day sd1 is very important to reach closer to your customer so uh, SD1 is allowing organizations to provide their services directly from cloud to their branches, working from home employees or their customers across the globe. So those are the drivers pushing organizations to shift to digital. But there is always but. What are the implications of this? Once we have, once we are shifting to the digital, Okay, we have now our application. Our applications are hosted in the cloud. This makes it more reliable, more easy, faster, no bottlenecks. But guess what? Security is a problem. Secure to secure those applications, you are actually live, build, building your infrastructure at the enemy fields. You are closer to the customer, but at the same time, you are closer to the attackers and uh, all the security problems which you were before hiding behind your border router and border firewall and perimeter security solutions from those attacks. So this is a concern we need to consider. And once you have your SD1 implemented, of course you are closer to the customer, you have faster implementation, but you need to secure each and every branch, each and every endpoint. So it's another challenge again. Once you have your IoT, your um, bring your own device, those technology which increase the number of endpoints, numerous number of, of attacks, of, of uh, points of attacks now you have. So some, some of those devices are not even devices that you can secure. You cannot apply the security policies and regulation on those devices. And in some studies, 80% of the new application by 2030 will be held in the cloud. So we are not talking about small number here. 50% of the organization will adapt SD1 by end of this year, 2021. Can you imagine? And 125 billion endpoints will be there having IP address connected to the internet by 2030. So it's 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 a serious concern we need to see, we need to see about. So the, our uh, attack surface is wider, entry points are more, exit points are more, attackers are having the flexibility now to infiltrate into your network. They can also exfiltrate data from your network. So you need to check and consider and secure all those points. And let's see how we can do this. So ransomware, uh, again, as another challenge, ransomware is very critical now, causing a lot of loss millions billions of dollars are being um, um, considered as uh, a loss in in the, in, in the industry uh, also malwares malwares is a very critical issue organization need to consider malwares and especially that dns 
especially DNS protocol are being used heavily in every and each, on, on, uh, let me say, in the majority of the malware attacks. So you need to consider a way to fix this problem. Those are the challenges. Let's see how operationally this affects the organizations now. What organization usually do to mitigate those challenges? They apply multiple security solutions. They have the firewalls, endpoints, the email security, the file security, the too many silos of security solutions and too many threat feeds they are receiving from, this, from those solutions. And this leads to a numerous number of alerts, notifications coming every day, every hour, every minute to the SecOps teams. It, it needs a lot, a huge number of hours and efforts to understand and analyze and investigate those alerts and notifications. And as we already know, the skills required as the resources needed to fix, to analyze all these and a number of information we don't have it right now. Still, the, most of the organization, organizations are not ready yet with, with those resources. So the cybersecurity skills is still is a, a worldwide is a skill we are building. So we are not ready yet for this. And still we are doing our investigation in a manual way. So we waste a lot of time, a lot of efforts. And this time is in, in benefit of the attackers, not on, of the organization. So what, what we actually need, what we need, what, what we are looking for is a solution that provides us a visibility across a, everywhere. Visibility across whatever I have mentioned in the previous slides, your endpoints, your SD1 branches, your uh, data center, your IoT devices, each and everything in your infrastructure. You need to have, once, once we say visibility, visibility is, it's to have everything in a single monitor, in a single screen, you know everything about your infrastructure. If single point is hidden or you or, or confused, it can be a risk and it can be an attack point. You, you need to protect everything in your network. You need to protect your, your employees working from home, working from, um, from coffee shops, uh, from branches across the globe, um, uh, coming from internet, from the cloud, from the data center, from inside your infrastructure, wherever they are coming from. And whatever the device is, IoT device or PC or mobile or uh, notebook or iPad or whatever. So we need the visibility automation. We need to protect everything and everywhere. And finally, we need to reduce the cost. We don't want organizations to achieve security to pay too many uh, uh, threat feeds, uh, solution of security. We will have uh, this. Uh, how to reduce this cost? Let me let me show you. So once you integrate the solutions together. The best option to do this is the DNS. DNS is very uh, a critical um, a protocol on your infrastructure. It is touching each and everything. DNS is everywhere. Each and every transactional over your infrastructure starts with DNS, ends with DNS. So once you have the visibility on, the, on your DNS and IP addresses, once you have a solid DDI solution with full visibility on all the transactions and traffic running over your infrastructure. And by the way, whether it is on-prem, virtual, over cloud, multi-cloud, or even hybrid model of, uh, of infrastructure. So this will give you the flexibility, the, the full visibility over everything. So you can start your transformation journey step by step. So you can still have your workload on brim on your data center and start shifting and migrating your applications one by one over to the cloud, which will give you the flexibility to, to go to through this journey safely. And the, the, you will get it step by step, not as, as one shot, as usually organization do, and then they stuck. Uh, they stuck from the cost perspective, from the resources, availability from uh, customer experience even. So uh, having the, this option, having the solution manage, which can manage your workload wherever it is, will give you this option. So integrating the solutions together through a, a DDI solution, through DNS, it will give you, it will reduce the time to rem of remediation by two thirds and it is tested. Uh, it will eliminate the silos, everything will be integrated. So it will reduce the number of notifications and alerts you are receiving. 
you will get only what is important. Um, many, many uh, uh, alerts and notifications are, are coming from different sources, which are the same. So by integrating those together, building on the DNS application uh, protocol, you will, you will get only what is important. You will save the efforts and time of your security operation team. Of course, better ROI will be there because you will save in your next upgrade and refresh of your existing security stack solutions. You don't have the you don't have to follow the same sizing you did before, because the notifications, as I said, are less, and the uh, utilization of utilization of your firewalls, DNS, all the security solutions are being less. So, in summary, what we are talking about here is improving the efficiency. You already have all the security solutions, but to improve the efficiency of what you have and reduce the cost, you will need you need to build organizations need to build on the integration of those devices together, on integration of the solutions together. The thread feeds should be integrated. And also we will have you will end up by having an actionable remediation solution. It will not only stop the, the attack, it will not only know everything about the attack, where it is reaching, who is the user, who is the device, which, which, uh, which type, which model, which, which type of data are being exfiltrated. All this information, we have it. But also it will integrate with the firewall, with the endpoint, with the vulnerability manager to stop this attack immediately. And it will take this action automatically, not manually as before. You can imagine how much efforts are, are less needed from your security team now, how much you are saving uh, from costs point of view, and how much it, a more efficient SIM solution and SOC efficiency will, you will have in your organization. So I hope everything was clear in this session. I, um, I ask you please to send any questions or queries, uh, just write it down, I will, uh, I will take care of it. Thank you so much for hearing. Uh, it was great meeting you today. Enjoy the rest of the day with the, with the event. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I'm sure you know, like the audience enjoyed it um, as much as we, we did. Um, so yes, uh, thank you so much for sharing your valuable uh, time with us. And uh, with that, uh, Dear delegates, uh, we come to an end of the keynotes and uh, sessions of the World Sierra 200 uh, Bahrain. And uh, it's now time uh, for the most interesting part of the day, uh, the Sierra 200 Bahrain Awards. So prior to announcing the winners, a quick recap of, of how the process of the World Sierra 200 is going to be. So each country editions, uh, we would be announcing uh, the CIO winners from that country. Uh, after uh, the country rounds are over, we would be selecting uh, the top CIOs from the winners, okay? Uh, these would be the selected CIOs who would be flying in uh, to the UAE for the grand finale. It would be an all expense paid trip for the CIO. So this process will continue for all the 36 countries that we are going to. Top selected CIOs from all these countries would be flying in for the grand finale on November 17th and 18th. So we are as excited as you are to see who is going to be the top 200 of the CIO 200. But uh, prior to that, uh, let's see who are the winning CIOs of the CIO 200 Bahrain today. Let's have the winners, please.
congratulations uh, to all the winners. A big cheers to all of you out there. And uh, as we said, we are truly excited to see who the top winners from these winners are going to be and who we would be seeing in uh, the finale. Uh, so all the winners uh, will be getting a blockchain verified certificate from Global CIO Forum. Right after the event, it would be delivered straight to your inbox. Okay, so congratulations once again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you face to face very soon. On that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we come to an end of this wonderful day one of the CIO 200 2021. Thank you so much for being with us for the last uh, two and a half, three hours. We do really hope that uh, you have had some great takeaways from all the presentations and sessions that uh, we have had so far. Once again, I would like to thank all our speakers and panelists who em embellished this event today with their presence and took out time from their schedule. And before we go, once again, a big shout out to all our partners who have made this journey more interesting for us. Thank you. Going out to Infoblox, BMB, Laserfish, Veritas, F5, Exclusive Networks, Arkin, and finesse. This is me signing off and we look forward to seeing you in the next edition. That would be our Saudi Arabia round of CIO 200 that would be held on September 9th. So till then, uh, good day to all of you. Stay safe, stay secure and take care.